So ChatterCon 2020 has finally come and passed. Let's review the stuff that was being discussed in Cheno Live specifically because I didn't bother watching the other streams because, you know, I was asleep. And since this thing is all coming out in three weeks, let's give some final and more importantly, some organized thoughts. So let's get into it. The first thing I want to do is basically address the big elephant in the room when it comes to Cheno Live 2020. And that is the fact that there was no Railjack. The fact that there was no Railjack does mean that this particular Tenno Live is simply the worst Tenno Live I've ever seen. Zero out of ten, and that is why I am no longer playing Warframe. This is now going to be a Destiny channel. Let's move on. Alright, okay, let's actually kick off with the Hydroid Prime trailer. Now, if you ask me, I reckon this is probably the most amount of effort the DE has ever put into a Prime trailer. And this... The reason why I say this is because, first off, this is actually the second longest Prime trailer that DE has ever made. This is right after the Valkyrie Prime trailer. The Valkyrie Prime trailer was about 2 minutes 50 seconds altogether as a video. The Hydroid Prime trailer is just over 2 minutes. Every other Prime trailer hovers between the 48 second mark and the 1 minute 30 mark. The other thing that I'd like to commend is that this particular Prime trailer seems to actually be using multiple sets. So what do I mean by that? We seem to have two very distinct environments that the animation and the cinematography is taking place in. You look at all of the other Prime trailers, it's all one specific set. It's all one specific area. Even the Valkyrie Prime trailer, with all the cuts and thrills and spills and all that jazz, it's still just one area with all of the animation happening within that one stage. Whereas, in my opinion, I think the Hydro Prime trailer is using two stages. The first stage, of course, being inside the water where all of the Grineer are just floating around, so not really a whole lot of animation being used in that particular set, whereas the other set would be everything that happens on the land. So obviously, everything to do with Hydroid actually killing those enemies, everything to do with the Grineer trying to hover and find Hydroid and all of that jazz. So that's it. And I think it's really awesome that this meme <laughs> has finally come to pass. We have waited two or three long years i don't even remember how long we've waited but either way the hydro plan trailer is finally a thing and now we need to figure out what else d is going to take bloody forever to get happening let's move on to the next thing which is of course the broken warframe i.e zaku warframe now zaku warframe on this channel shall henceforth be known as zaku warframe as in Shah's Zaku Warframe. That's absolutely 100% correct. Now, I haven't tried any of their abilities. And before we continue, yes, I am saying their abilities. Rebecca on Twitter has confirmed that Zaku is an agendered Warframe. So I am expecting the quarter rate to go nuts any day now. My main concern with Zaku is that their abilities are based in void damage. Now, here's the thing. Void damage has a minus 50% modifier, i.e. it only does half damage against Grineer Flesh. Grineer Flesh happens to encapsulate all Grineer except for like rollerballs and stuff. So pretty much all Grineer are going to be stronger against Zaku because he does or she does. No, they do because they do less damage against those Grineer. The same thing happens with fossilized flesh. So that means that all infested that matter, i.e. Toxic Ancients, Healer Ancients, Disruptor Ancients, they are also stronger against Zaku because of that Void Damage Multiplier. So that is my big concern. Is Zaku going to be able to do enough damage to deal with these enemies or is Zaku going to be using their weapons a lot more than their abilities? I'm not entirely sure. Their abilities seem to be alright based on what we've seen, but at the same time I do feel like maybe they're a little bit on the weak side, not 100% sure about that point is, not entirely sure how I feel about Zaku's first ability, essentially being a scuffed augment for Oberon and Saren, etc, etc. Remember, Oberon, Saren, Fault, they all have augments that not just give themselves extra radiation or corrosive or electric damage, etc, etc, but also gives all of their allies extra radiation, corrosive or electric damage, etc, etc. Whereas Zaku's is essentially just giving themselves extra void damage on their weapons. Not entirely sure how I feel about that. We'll just have to see. The second thing is that Zaku's second ability seems like a short duration laser. Now that might just be Rebecca pressing 2 and then pressing 2 again to turn it off or holding 2 for a very short amount of time and then letting go. Hopefully this ability can be channeled because I feel like if it's going to be a void laser, it really should be a void laser that you can use ad infinitum. For example, like Soulgate with Wisp. I think that might be a better choice. We'll just have to see how we go with that. 
The next thing is that I'm not entirely sure what's going on with Zaku's third ability. It is a three in one ability, so we're just gonna have to see. Ultimately, I can't really make a particularly good assessment on Zaku's third ability until we try it. So we'll just wait until that happens. It's gonna come in about three weeks or something like that. And finally, we have Zaku's fourth ability, which probably seems solid. Having extra damage reduction, having extra evasion, being a smaller body to run around with because you're essentially the skeleton. That could be really, really good. Not entirely sure how much damage Saku can do by flinging the rest of its body, or rest of their body, I guess is a better way of saying it. Not sure how much damage Zaku can do with that ability, but maybe that's not what you need to focus on. Maybe it's all about that damage reduction. We'll just have to see how Zaku works. Ultimately, I guess I'm a little bit disappointed that we can't throw around Zaku's head or like Zaku's arms. Kind of looking for a medieval kind of approach where you could like rip your arm off and then beat someone with it as if it's like a stick. But unfortunately, that kind of medieval with Sir Dan, whatever his name is, that is not how Zaku is going to work. So unfortunately, that's not what we're going to go with. All right, let's move on to the Helminth Room. And I'm going to be real here. The Helminth Room was the highlight for me of the entire TennoCon. If you ask me, what's the biggest thing that is coming with the heart of Deimos? It's the Helminth Room. 100%. Frankly, I feel like this Helminth Room update is better than everything inside the open world of the heart of Deimos, which we'll talk about in a second. This is the thing that I am most excited for. Ironically enough, this actually satisfi satisfies a prediction that I made in that TennoCon 2020 predictions video. Now, I actually listed that particular prediction as a pie in the sky prediction, something that I didn't think was going to happen. But hell, here it is. We actually have that particular thing essentially sort of come to pass. Now, it's not exactly the economy rework that I was looking for. I was really thinking a little bit lower along the lines of like, getting rid of a bunch of these resources and then sort of rebalancing everything to cost resources that you can get from everywhere else. But I will take this. This is fine. This makes every resource super duper useful once again. And also, the best thing is, there's a good to fair chance that the whole helmet thing could very well be something that happens ad infinitum in the sense that in much the same way that, to me at least, I find Kuvu to be useful all the damn time because I'm always re-rolling Rivens, I get the feeling that we're going to find the use of every single resource on the Helminth Room to be super duper useful because we're always going to want to, I don't know, uninstall and install new abilities on our favorite Warframes in particular so that we can just keep playing our favorite Warframes a little bit differently. We're just going to have to see what happens. but. Either way, I really like what's going to happen with this, and also I really like that it's going to be a modular Warframe. We've we finally come to modular Warframes, ladies and gentlemen. There has been a lot of theory crafting as to how we could do modular Warframes. Is it going to be a build your Warframe from scratch? Like a Zor, like a kit gun, like a mower? Is it going to be like that? Nope. It's actually going to be take a pre-existing Warframe and swap out its kit. That's it. It's so easy. So that was going to be a fat Omega lol in my opinion. But here's the thing, and I do need to stress this. We don't know what abilities are going to be extracted from each Warframe yet. Okay? I want to be very, very clear. We don't know. So don't try and set yourself up for disappointment. I am not going to speculate on what can and cannot be removed. All we know is they've specifically said that shock and pull were demonstrated, and they've specifically said that something that is quote unquote a signature ability, whatever that means, like desecrate from Necros, that's not going to be extracted. So you can't do, I guess, a universal super ultra mega fat chocolate fudge coated mega bloody goddamn super friggin' farming Warframe. You can't really do that. And also ultimates are out of the question as well. So that means that even the Strangle Dome or Pilferoid, that's not going to happen either. So unfortunately, that's not going to be a thing. But otherwise, every other ability, if it's not quote unquote a signature ability, up for grabs. Completely up for grabs. Alternatively, it looks like you can also insert Helminth abilities. Now, in the demonstration, they only got up to level 2 on their Helminth. Not entirely sure how you're going to get up levels in the Helminth. Maybe it's just by feeding them. We'll just have to see. But point is, 
there's probably going to be a lot of helmet abilities available to choose from on top of all of the abilities that Warframes have that you actually can use. So we're just going to have to see what we have available. Meanwhile, the big thing is that you can actually have different abilities on different mod configs. So for example, you have the Universal Mag build, which I might actually change again. <laughs> so that's going to be hilarious. All of that effort suddenly thrown out the window because I'm going to probably put a new ability ability on mag on that slot because maybe something make, makes a lot more sense instead of pull right and then all of a sudden i have the universal map build using some random warframe ability plus magnetize plus polarize plus crush whereas on my second config it could be a totally different build but it still uses pull magnetize polarize crush i'm not entirely sure we're just gonna have to see what happens with that but definitely having that ability on different configs kind of thing that is super duper good in my opinion my main concern with this is that is changing the abilities of your warframe like putting former on a warframe in a sense that do i need to re-level it from level zero back to level 30. usually this takes a while i tend to do this nowadays by doing a railjack affinity farm but other people have other ways to do it so obviously you can do it however you want but because steel path war railjack isn't a thing yet it's still gonna take a while, so I'm not entirely sure how I want to do this. Could actually be something like Steel Path Hydron. Maybe that's the answer, or maybe something like Steel Path Mot for like an hour. I don't know. I don't know. We're just gonna have to see. What this also means is that pretty much all Warframe builds across YouTube are about to become 50% irrelevant. Because now that quote unquote base abilities is a thing, at the moment, all relevant Warframe builds are only relevant to base Warframe abilities. At some point, we're going to have to have Warframe builds that are like, Alright everyone, let's have a look at this mag build today. So this is the universal mag build. And the first thing you want to note is that we're actually swapping out pull for some sort of ability. We're swapping out crush for some sort of ability that is probably better at stripping armor i'm not entirely sure either way this is going to be a really weird moment in time if you ask me now the big thing is with the warframe overviews that i'm doing i'm just going to stick with these base abilities okay so i will be ignoring any helmet abilities i will be ignoring any other warframe abilities that you can slot and replace certain abilities in warframes when it comes to doing things like the damage score the survivability score and all that jazz completely ignoring all of that i'm also going to be completely ignoring all of that when it comes to talking about the kit overview so let's say for example we're looking at mesa now in my opinion mesa's first ability is completely and utterly useless therefore mesa will most certainly be getting a minus two on the kit usability score to get a maximum pending other abilities of eight she will still get that 8 maximum score, despite the fact that I could very well replace the first ability with something like Shock from Vault, which I don't know if that's going to make things better. But either way, that's going to be how I will be approaching all of this when it comes to doing overview videos. Okay, awesome. And finally, of course, the big thing that they teased is, of course, the heart of Deimos, the actual open world in Deimos. Now, quick thing is that all of Deimos is apparently going to be replacing all of the derelict derelict keys are about to get completely scrapped great that's probably a good thing in much the same way that getting rid of void keys was probably a good thing as well to be replaced of course with relics and all that stuff so in much the same way that now the void is open season go in there whenever you want the derelict is also about to be open season go in there whenever you want i'm expecting it to be like earth and like Venus where basically by going into the heart of Deimos it's an open world that looks completely different to every other mission that exists which will probably still be using the good old-fashioned derelict tile set there's nothing really wrong with the derelict tile set so I think that's going to be how that's going to work now 
here's the thing. In terms of them explaining the heart of Demos, it was a pretty standard open world reveal. So they did a bounty, they showed a new way to traverse being K-Bugs, as they've been called in chat, so that's going to be the official name that I will be using to describe the bugs that you can actually jump on. The big thing, of course, is that you can actually use weapons on those K-Bugs, so I'm assuming that you can actually use weapons on the K-Drive as well, so we'll just have to see how that goes. They also killed a few things, they showed off some of the new enemies for the infested, so that's really, really good. Hopefully we can see some of these infested enemies make their way to the normal missions as well. One person on chat actually did mention that the infested finally look a lot more alien. I think that is 100% true, so I am really excited to see some of those enemies show up in other places as well. We did get that, possibly? No, we didn't. We didn't get Noxes in the planes only for them to show up in missions. I think we got it the other way around. I don't remember. Point is, hopefully we're going to see some of those enemies as well. And of course, finally, they showed a big thing. So in much the same way that in the Planes of Eidolon reveal, they showed an Eidolon. And then in the Orb Valis reveal, they showed an Orb Mother. At the end of the Heart of Deimos reveal, they showed a great big worm thing. And so that's going to be basically the big enemy that we fight at the Heart of Deimos. So probably won't be able to do that on stream again because in much the same way that it kind of already lags my computer if I try to stream the Orb Mother and the Eidolon. Yeah, I'm not going to be able to actually stream the big worm fight, unfortunately. So that's just really unfortunate. Anyway, let's move on because in the heart of Deimos, here's the thing. Relationship ended with Natar. Now Mother is my space mom. And that's why when and if the new war were to show up this year, I'm going to be killing Lotus. Oh heck yeah. Here's the thing. There's also going to be some more Oricon lore as well, so that's really, really good. I always welcome some more Oricon lore. And finally, possibly the most exciting thing in the Heart of Demos is of course the Necrobex. Now, Apparently, they are an enemy faction. Not entirely sure what the deal is, but we will be fighting them. But at the same time, somehow, we're also going to be piloting them as operators? We'll just have to see. But, as the Zaku Warframe shall henceforth be known as the Zaku Warframe, the Necromax shall now be henceforth known on this channel as Gundams. That's right, we are now getting Gundams in Warframe. 100%. No ifs, ands, or buts. I don't want to. No, no. I don't want to hear anything about it. They are Gundams. That's the deal. So that's pretty much it. Let me know what you think about all of this in the comments below. What did you think about Tenno Live specifically? Because again, I was asleep when Tenno Con was happening. So let me know what you think about Tenno Live in the comments below. Is there anything that you got really excited about? Is there anything that you didn't really like aside from the fact that there was no Railjack Boo? Let me know in the comments. Otherwise. Hope you guys enjoyed it. If you like this video, hit that like button, subscribe for more Warframe content, and until next time, I'll see you guys later. Thanks for watching. Bye.